in, in that growing up period, when did you eventually move to Kuala Lumpur? You know, funnily enough, I don't mix with young people. Although I was young at that point of time, I was only 24, 25 years old. I mix with uh, a lot of elderly people. I suppose because of my, uh, the relationship my father had with some elderly people. And I always go to them or they always uh, take me out. Uh, like um, uh, Ng Hyang, the big property owner of Kuala Lumpur, you know. Uh, he used to take me for dinner, but uh, very cheap dinner, you know, at the <laughs> Jalan Sultan, <laughs> where we went there for 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 dinner uh, every month. Actually, he used to come and get me to go and have dinner with him, and he, uh, in this uh, small shed uh, at Jalan Sultan. I, I don't think that shed is there now. It's gone, but the food was exceptionally good. And uh, I, I, I had fond memories of uh, people of, of, of 20, 30 years older than me. And these are the kind of people that I associate myself with. Even when I started work, uh, my friends were older than me. And uh, I didn't get to I did get a chance to interact with young people like you, you know. I'm very lucky tonight that I meet so many young people. Uh, of course, I am very lucky and I'm, I feel honoured that I met with all of you. But uh, my, my experience, uh, as far as I can recollect, was to mix with these uh, elderly people. And, uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's nothing amiss. Uh, I enjoyed it and I, I learned a great deal from this interaction with elderly people and I learned a lot from them, definitely. But I would have enjoyed mixing with young people of my age, I'm sure. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to do that much. So we have a lot of young people who don't really know what it was like in the 70s in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also read that you were a person who enjoyed his cars. Could you share with us a little bit about your time in the 70s and 80s and the cars that you loved? I don't have cars. <laughs> I don't have cars. I never enjoyed cars. I, I, I had a, a Lancia Flamina. Yeah. That's a car I owned at that point of time. Once because uh, that was the fashionable car around. And I was asked to buy this car by Sami Velu. <laughs> because, very selfish man, you know. He wanted me to buy this because he owns one. And uh, I suppose he wanted to get uh, parts from my car in case he's broke down. <laughs> That's the only thing I could think of. But anyway, uh, I, I, I bought this car and uh, I was using it. Uh, not not for the fun of it. It was it was a good vehicle. It's, uh, it's the Italian make, and uh, it's designed by 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 Pininfarina, one of these uh, top designers in uh, in Italy at that time for cars, for body works, for cars. And with that said, I don't have many cars. Oh, with a very desirable Italian car. Which yeah. nightclub in KL would you be bringing it to? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the most popular night spot at that time was what was known as the Arthur's Cave. Yeah. Uh, that was the night spot that most people go to. And I used to use these uh, premises, apart from going for my food and drinks, also to talk to the Indonesians. At that time, um, there was this uh, rebellious movement against uh, Sukarno, and you know we had confrontasi. We had uh, we had this uh, crush Malaysia movement, engineered by late President Sukarno against us, and I was one of the young chaps assigned by Tengku. He said, "Why don't you mix around with this uh, 
dissidents from Indonesia and see whether or not we could find ways to um, uh, resolve this problem about this confrontation between Indonesia and Malaysia. And I used to use this place to bring the Indonesian leaders for food, for drinks, you know, uh, trying to, to persuade them, you know, why, why, why do you want to, to crush us? We're a small place, you know, and, and small people were newly independent and, uh, and we, we love to, to have better relationship with them. And, 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 and a lot of these people come, including one famous gentleman who became a general and nearly became president of uh, Indonesia, except for the fact that he, he was not a Muslim, uh, Colonel Mordani. And he later became General Mordani and was, uh, was more or less de facto president of, of, of Indonesia at one point in time. He was close to all of us here in Kuala Lumpur. And he used to camp in the Arthur's Cave, you know, <laughs> uh, so to speak, because we used to uh, meet there and uh, discuss uh, a lot of things. And the other person was Professor Sumitro, who became President Suharto's uh, besan, you know, because his son married uh, Suharto's daughter. And, uh, and we befriended these people. And, uh, and that's how we, we managed to get access to the Indonesians in order to broker a peace, peace deal, not just by me, but by all of us, you know, combined, trying to persuade the Indonesians to drop this idea of wanting to crush us, you know. Why did they want to crush us, Uncle? I think it's a very complicated story. It's not just wanting to crush us. I think it's uh, because of this uh, Karachi, Beijing, uh, Jakarta axis that was established during that time during the Afro-Asian solidarity that wanted to uh, make sure that all these countries which are non-aligned mm -hmm. uh, would um, uh, impose their will on countries like us, which is very pro-British or very pro-West, and uh, and any any one of us which is not pro Bandung or pro 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 the Afro Asian um, will will get this kind of warning from them, and that's why Sukarno took took this uh, took this measure against us especially when Tengku just announced that he wanted to have a merger with Singapore, Sabah, Sarawak to form Malaysia. And that's when uh, President Makapagal of Philippines, uh, together with uh, Sukarno, uh, opposed this, this merger arrangement and say that this is a new colonialist plot, wanting to encircle Indonesia and Philippines. I mean, it's, it's something that we cannot accept. <laughs> How can we, a small country, encircle a big country like Indonesia or even um, the, the Philippines, which, which is a bigger population than us and has so many big islands uh, straddling the, the Pacific? But anyway, uh, that was the ploy uh, to, to oppose us. Um, probably in your early 30s, late yes, 20s? Uh, 20s, yes. You were already been handpicked to be involved in, um, well, international relationship representing Malaysia, espionage. Well, because uh, intelligence. I think the exposure that I was lucky to get, even during the Cuban crisis, I was in the United Nations. You know, that was in 1962. I was already in the United Nations, and um, and we saw the interplay of power between the, the people around this region, you know, and all were, were very pro, very pro the non-aligned non forces and uh, very left in their thinking. And, uh, and we could sense that we were encircled, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, of course, people like Tengku, Tun Razak, Dr. Ismail, 
Tun Tan Siu Sin, Sam Bantan, all these people uh, were very pro-West. They were, they were exposed to the Western culture, Western education, and naturally they have no, no inclination towards being associated with this Afro-Asian uh, uh, leaning which, which was born out of the Bandung Conference, you know. And, and we were still uh, a, a colony at that time, or still under the domination of the British. And, um, and of course, uh, we, we were frowned upon by, by these new forces uh, as, uh, as being very pro, very pro-West, you see. <laughs> uh, eventually, in 1970 to 74, you were actually picked to lead the new corporate Malaysia restructuring immediately after the May 13 riots. As uh, Permodalan National CEO, the chairman of, of uh, Pernas, uh, can you share your experiences? What it was like for a, a young man uh, from Kelantan changing the fate yeah. of the nation? Well, I was not picked actually, but it so happened I was uh, elected as the president of the Malay Chamber and by virtue of that I was also elected as the president of the National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And, and because of uh, uh, the desire of us in extending our relationship with the neighboring countries within ASEAN, um, we forged uh, ahead the formation of an ASEAN chamber and because of, by extension, I became the president of, of the ASEAN chamber and because of this, uh, it gives us interest to, to make sure that we really re-equip ourselves uh, within our own society. I was, I was not a business leader, I was just uh, uh, representing the business interests which were uh, put forward by the Chinese Chamber, by the Indian Chamber, the Associated Indian Chamber, and by the Malaysian uh, Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, and of course the um, Malaysia International Chamber of Commerce, uh, because there was a dearth of uh, Malay businesses anyway to talk of. But uh, the big businesses were uh, owned by the MICC members and, and of course the Chinese Chamber. So we thought that the time has come that uh, we should, we should uh, share the fortune of, of, of our independent country and uh, make uh, things go around and uh, bring everybody into this modern sector. And that's when I was asked to lead these various organizations. But before doing that, remember I mentioned to you just now, we, we were facing the insurgency, insurgency problems in the country. So I was picked to uh, head a mission, uh, ostensibly to, to, to negotiate for trade with China. Uh, but by that time we didn't have any uh, diplomatic relationship with China yet but I was uh, nevertheless sent to China to, to talk to, to the Chinese leaders. I didn't know that I was going to talk to very important Chinese leaders. Actually, when I was sent there, I thought just to talk to business leaders in Canton uh, and in Beijing. But when I got to Canton, I was told that uh, I've got to go to Beijing to meet an important person there. I didn't know who this important person was, but I was forewarned by late tone Dr. Ismail, who was Minister of Internal Security then, uh, that uh, I'll be meeting somebody very important in China. He said, if, if, uh, if, if uh, time permits and if the opportunity arises, and for me to broach the idea of having a normalization of relationship between uh, Malaysia and, and China and he said it's important that you broach the subject and see what the reaction is uh, you're not to negotiate but to to assess what the reaction is because we need to 
um, to to get them to 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 cease uh, uh, ha uh, having uh, creating these problems for us for us in the country. Others, we cannot we cannot we cannot uh, put our economic plans into into action. Nor can we help develop this country the way we want to. So he said, "You do that." So I said. If I get the chance, I'll do it. So after being in Canton for two days, we were put on a plane and we were sent to Beijing. And when I was at the Great Wall, visiting the Great Wall, uh, one of the escorts or one of the uh, chaps uh, who was uh, keeping, uh, who was in attendance with us, uh, whispered to me and said that uh, uh, his boss wanted to see me. So he said, uh, you must, you must uh, go back to Beijing now from the Great Wall. I, so I just followed, you know, got into the car and went back to Beijing. And uh -huh. we were brought to the Great, uh, to the People's, uh, what is it, the, the Great Hall of the, of the People. And there I was brought and I confronted uh, uh, Li Chou Enlai, the Prime Minister of uh, China, together with uh, Li Xiaoqi, who became the President of China after, after I left China, and with about seven or eight other Politburo members. And I just told them what uh, our leaders wanted, that is to have normalization, of relations uh, and this hostility towards us here and we can have meaningful relationship uh, on terms acceptable to both parties and uh, Choi and Lai said no 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 it's nothing to do with us he said uh, this is the work of the uh, Marxist Leninist group in Moscow he said nothing to do with Beijing he said you tell your your leaders this when you go back he said, uh, we forever wants to have uh, a good relationship with your country. We have no plans for hegemony. And uh, I remember, he said, when uh, we were coming back to China from uh, Paris, he said, uh, we had to stop in Penang. And we were in Penang, he said, fortunately, because the boat that he was traveling in had some engine trouble. To stop in Penang, he was there for a few days, and he said, "Lucky," he said, "this Tankaki uh, sent him a car from Singapore, and he joined uh, Tankaki came to Penang and joined him in Penang, and persuaded him to catch a boat from Singapore to go to Shanghai. So they 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 spent some time in Kuala Lumpur after." After, after Penang and went down to Singapore to catch a boat to go to Shanghai and he was full of praise for this Tan Ka Ki who incidentally was the father-in-law of uh, Lee Kong Chan Chan Shi Lee Kong Chan whom I knew very well as a, as a small boy and, uh, and he said this man gave up everything in order to go back to China to serve in the first cabinet of uh, Mao Zedong in 1949. And that was Tan Ka Ki, he said. A great proletariat, a great socialist, he said. Uh, that's, that's the conversation I had with him. And uh, I came back, reported, and that's when the, the Malaysian government initiated talks in Warsaw and in United Nations to have diplomatic relations with China. We should let to uh, and Tun Razak's Tun Razak went visit. After that, yes. You met before Tun Razak yeah. went to China. Yeah.